is, uh, has been working in this field um, going way back before mo most people even heard of uh, Nikola Tesla or so-called free energy or yeah, any, any of these kind of topics. Uh, he worked with uh, Borderlin, uh, Borderlands uh, years ago with uh, Eric Dollard and uh, Michael Knox and some of these others who were kind of doing what um, we've been doing with this conference and a and Electronic Media uh, way back and they were kind of the source for a lot of the uh, alternative energy uh, sciences. They produced a lot of videos and books and um, were kind of in the uh, uh, kind of the pioneers of bringing out a lot of alternative science to people. And uh, uh, over the years, he, he wound up in Spokane, and uh, we got to know each other, and he was working with, uh, he lived north of Spokane, and uh, came to Spokane around 2004 or so, I think. He worked with uh, John Bedini for about a year, uh, got a million dollars in funding that went to developing the commercial battery chargers that uh, pretty much uh, can give a lead-acid battery um, a theoretical infinite lifespan. It's amazing technology. Uh, in 2008, Peter and I got together and started uh, A&P Electronic Media, which is what A&P stands for, is Aaron and uh, Peter. Uh, the first book we put out was Lessons in Advanced Perception, which was about raising our awareness and consciousness, and it didn't even have anything to do with uh, energy sciences. And the next book we put out was uh, Save on Home Energy, a uh, very boring topic, but people were using the information in this book and were literally cutting their energy bills in half. I'd like to start with thanking uh, Aaron for keeping this venue uh, going. He he's started, you know, uh, the rumor that he might not do it next year. It sounds, hopefully it sounds like um, my announcement of retirement at the end of 2016. <laughs> Um, because this remains, um, th I think, one of the most important venues on the planet right now as far as the real release of, of important information. There's a core group of people who are actually um, you know, moving a significant amount of information into the public domain, which is what's important, so that it um, uh, really can be disseminated. So today's um, lecture begins with a mystery. And um, as the slide says, uh, that this, this depiction here is um, a device which I call Troy Reed's hot fan. And Troy Reed was known in the 1980s and the 1990s as an inventor of a permanent magnet motor and various other supposed self-running machines. He had also invented some technologies that he claimed could extend the range of electric vehicles. But at some point around 1998, a friend of mine and I were in Troy Reed's shop in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to see a technology he said could help us extract gold from certain ores that we had access to. So it was really unrelated to uh, any energy uh, ideas, the reason I was there. And it was at this meeting that he showed us what he called his hot fan. I signed a non-disclosure agreement on that day, but 25 years have passed since then, and I'm going to discuss this invention with you today. But before that, I just before we get into exactly what that is, I'd like to review the early reports of discoveries by Heinrich Lenz in the, in the 1830s, just so we have some basis for understanding how the forces that are uh, happening here. Right here, the speed of the, of the magnetic field in the stator is running so fast, it wants to produce high voltages because the, the, the relative speeds between these two, the, the, the wires in the slots and the, the speed that the flux from the stator uh, is swinging by it is so high that it wants to generate a high voltage, but it's still the, the short circuit conditions of the of the rotor don't let it uh, produce a high voltage. It just can't generate the voltage against the short. Uh, so this is what's called an impedance mismatch, and that's the so you can't get any reasonable energy transfer here, primarily because of uh, impedance mismatch. What's 
very interesting is that these machines are made every day. These slip ring motors are made every day and all of the modifications that I have just shown you are not in the motor. You can buy this thing right off the shelf and put these external circuits on it and make them run that way. I mean, this was, this was before the advent of solid state inverters. This was the way to take DC and turn it into AC. These machines have been around since the 1920s. I have only presented three examples today of what may be possible when relatively common electromechanical machines are understood and fitted to operate in unconventional windows of opportunity. This may be the last. And I, I, well, I'm giving these lectures because I have figured all this stuff out over the years and they're sitting in my files, okay? These lectures are about emptying my files, okay? Uh, because I'm never going to be able to get to a lot of these things in, in my lifetime, but I have I've spent decades um, exploring these things and have come to certain conclusions about uh, what the principles of operation, where they have to, f where the shoehorn put them. And um, so this may be the last uh, Electric Motor Secrets uh, presentation that I ever give, but I pretty much have covered you know, uh, unusual configurations, ordinary DC motors, ordinary AC motors. I think I've covered the, the basics. So um, I hope this leads to inspiring others to continue this research. Thank you very much. Thank you.